So abstract reasoning, I think is easily the weirdest section of this exam. Hey, hey everyone, hope you're doing really, really well and welcome back to my channel for yet another UCAT video. <laughs> Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the tricky section of the UCAT exam that's to do with strange shapes called abstract reasoning. Now, I actually ended up really liking this section because there's a very clear and systematic approach that you can learn to these questions that I'm about to teach you in this video. And once you've got that, it makes it a whole lot easier. Now, if this is the first time you're watching any of my videos, welcome. My name's Julia and I'm currently a third year medical student studying at a university in London called King's College. So as with all my other previous UCAT videos, we're going to start off by looking at what abstract reasoning actually is. Now aside from looking a bit bizarre, this section of the exam tests your ability to identify patterns and trends amongst abstract shapes where you have irrelevant and distracting material to cause confusion. So basically what you need to make sure you have is a good solid understanding of common patterns. This section is made up of 55 questions which are divided into 13 sets and you're given 13 minutes to complete the section which if we do the maths gives you one minute per set. Now the good thing about this section is that it's the shortest out of the whole exam and doesn't involve any reading or any calculating so it's literally just a case of looking at a bunch of shapes, applying a set of rules to these shapes Bish bash bosh and it's over before you know it. Now, there are four types of questions in abstract reasoning which go like this. The first type of question is the standard type in which you're given two sets, so set A and set B, followed by a test shape. And what you need to do is decide whether the test shape belongs to set A, set B, or neither set. In the second type of question, you'll be shown a series of shapes that somehow alternate from one box to the next following a specific rule. And what you need to do is work out what that rule is and apply it to the sequence to figure out which of four options will come next in the sequence. Now, the third type of question is sort of similar to the second where you're given a statement, which is basically two figures that are somehow linked to each other. And you need to figure out what that link is and apply it to another figure. And you'll be given four options to complete the statement, which is basically applying that same rule again. And finally, we have the fourth and final type of question, which is actually a variation of type one. So you're presented with a bunch of different test shapes and essentially you need to figure out if they go into set A or set B. So basically the same concept, just a bit more time consuming. Et voila, those are all the questions. Now, before I move on to telling you how to approach each question, I'm gonna run through how to recognize a pattern because there's a few concepts that you need to remember. Just as a heads up, this is a very long list, but I promise you that with enough repetition and enough practice, eventually it'll just come naturally to you. Rule number one is number. So one of the common things to look out for is the number of shapes, number of sides or edges, number of angles, which can be acute, obtuse or right angles, number of intersections, number of corners, number of lines, and finally, the number of edges or shapes that are touching the outside of the box. Basically, anything that you can count, you wanna examine. But always remember that when you're quantifying these things, they can either be absolute numbers or odd or even numbers. And so just because the numbers aren't the same or they're not adding up, just bear in mind, could they all be either odd or even? And that in itself is a pattern. Number two is position. So where exactly in the box are the shapes located? Is a specific shape always pushed towards a certain side or a certain corner? Or is a certain corner always occupied by the same coloured shape, perhaps? Also, think about the position of certain components relative to each other. So, for example, a square might always be to the left of a circle and a circle might always be to the right of a triangle. They're all things to think about, so just stay open-minded. Number three is shading and colour. So you want to keep an eye out for if specific shapes are always shaded black, white or grey and how does that differ between each set. Number four looks at the types of shapes. So how many of each angle do they have? Are they 2D or 3D? Um, do they have any concave or con... Conve con <laughs> concave or convex curves. By the way, really quickly as a side note, remember that a circle is counted as having one side. For rule number five, you wanna look at the size of the shapes. So, um, pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> number six is a little bit rarer, but still something you need to consider, which is lines of symmetry. So number one, are they present? And number two, how many? 
And finally, rule number seven looks at orientation and rotation of shapes. Now, rule number seven is especially applicable in sets containing arrows because you always wanna double check in which way the arrows are facing under which circumstance. So for instance, you could have a set where if you have only odd numbers of arrows, then they're all facing left. Whereas if they're all an even number, then they're all facing up or something like that. So just keep in mind the orientation of shapes. Now I know that all of that was a lot to take in. So just like I did in my last video, I'll be putting up a screen at the end of this one with all the rules that you need to know. So make sure you stay till the end. And as I said, do what you gotta do to learn it. Just have a systematic approach and I promise you it gets easier. Right, so next I'm gonna talk about how to actually approach each types of question, starting with types one and four because they're both so similar that you can use the same technique for both. So for these questions, ignore the test shapes for a second and go straight to the sets and you want to find a pattern in set A and set B. The way you do that is you want to find the simplest box in each set, which is usually the one with the least number of shapes, because remember every single box in a set has to follow the same pattern, so you want the least number of distractors. Now once you've found that simplest box, what you want to do is to try and identify a pattern by comparing it to the rest of the set using the rules that I just went through. Now remember to look at both the small details as well as the bigger picture and hopefully with those seven rules I just went through you'll be able to find a pattern. Now I know that it's an exhaustive list and I'm sorry but if you can be speedy you want to spend up to 45 seconds trying to identify a pattern and that way you'll have roughly five seconds to match each test shape to the sets. If you haven't managed to find a pattern in 45 seconds then what you do is flag, guess and just move on and then hopefully if you've got time at the end come back to it with a fresh set of eyes. As you'll know as with the whole rest of the exam this is an extremely time pressured section so you don't want to be spending too much time on a single set. I think another thing I want to add is just to sometimes go with your gut so if you're really really stuck just trust your gut instinct. Unfortunately you have to remember that there more often than not will be two or more patterns to a set so once you've found a pattern try not to get too excited straight away but just pause make sure that that pattern applies to every single box and you just want to double check that there aren't any more other patterns that you might be missing. When you're faced with sets where everything just looks the same and all of the patterns are super similar, what you want to do is focus on the position of each component within the box and also the colour because those two are usually what will give something away. Another top tip to remember is what are called conditional rules. So they follow the idea of if A does X then B does Y. So for example, um, if you have a big shape that is shaded then the small shape will be unshaded and vice versa. Or for example if you have arrows in a box just bear in mind that the rule could be that if an arrow is pointing towards a shape then it could be shaded whereas if it's pointing away from a shape then it could be unshaded. So anything like that is called a conditional rule and they are super super difficult to spot so you know easier said than done but just bear that in mind. Now I know I'm going through things quite quickly so feel free to rewind, take notes, whatever because now we're moving on to how to tackle type 2 and type 3 questions. For these questions that follow a sequence what you want to do is make sure that you analyse every single component within each box one by one. Now I'm going to teach you a mnemonic to help you out with that which goes puppies don't run calmly and what that stands for is what you need to pay special attention to in a sequence. Starting with P which is position so you want to check where each shape is positioned within the frame. D is for direction so which direction each component is facing. R is rotation so check if it's rotated as it goes along the sequence. And finally C stands for colour so you want to double check how each component changes colour with each sequential box. So the position, the direction, the rotation and the colour are the four most common factors that are changed within a sequence. So with that mnemonic hopefully you'll be able to to eliminate the options one by one and work out what the rule is in the sequence for type two and three questions. And you also get to think about puppies which are cute. <laughs> Next I'm going to talk about what you need to look out for in the most difficult types of sets starting with sets that contain only arrows. So when you have only arrows in a set what you want to look out for is the number of arrows, their position within each box, the number of arrow heads because remember some arrows might be double headed, the direction in which they're facing and finally the number of times they're touching the sides of the frame so whether they're just floating about in the middle or if there's one or two that are actually making contact with the sides. Generally speaking it's quite unusual to have shapes that actually make contact with the sides of the squares 
So if you see that in every box, let that ring a bell. And also double check if it could be a conditional rule. Next, I wanna talk about sets that contain letters and words. So the most important thing to remember in these sets is not to view the letters and words as letters and words, but make sure you view them from the stance of seeing them just as pictures. Just pretend for a second that you can't read. The most likely patterns you'll find in sets containing letters and words will be in the number of actual letters, in the number of right angles that you can make in the letters, the number of sides or lines that each letter contains, the position of each letter within each box, and finally, whether the letters have straight or curved edges. Remember again, it can never be to do with the meaning of the words or whether they're vowels or consonants, or if they're uppercase or lowercase, just ignore all of that for a second. Just see them as pictures. Also, as a top tip, if you see the letters E, F, H, L, or T, Remember that all of those five letters have right angles, so you wanna double check the right angles. On to the next type of question, which is looking at sets that contain familiar objects, such as clocks or smiley faces. And once again, it's super important that you don't view these smiley faces with a meaning. And once again, you see them only as pictures. So for example, if you have clocks, don't see them as telling the time, but instead look at the angles that the hands are making, whether they're obtuse or acute. Or perhaps if the hands of the clocks are of a specific thickness, or if they're touching the sides of the clock or just sort of floating about in the middle. So all of those are things to think about. And the same goes for the facial expressions. So ignore the expressions, but instead focus on what shapes and what components are included in the smiley faces. Next, if you see a set where you just have a bunch of squiggly lines, Things to think about will be the number of closed loops that the lines make, how many actual lines there are in each box, as well as the number of intersections or how many times they touch or cross over. And also, as I said before, remember you wanna look for combinations, so it's usually more than one rule. And finally, when you have sets where you just have a whole bunch of really complex shapes that are super random and it's all just a bit overwhelming, you'll be surprised to know that funnily enough, the more complicated the set, usually the fewer number of patterns there are. So once again, in the super complicated sets, what you wanna look out for is the number of shapes in each box, the number of intersections, the number of specific angles, so how many obtuse and how many acute angles, look out for lines of symmetry, and finally the number of sides that are touching. As a general rule, I was taught that if you see any intersections or any sides touching, then usually you wanna examine those first because that's a big clue. And once again, remember when you're counting the number of shapes, they can be either odd, even, or identical. Something else to remember, which again is easier said than done, is to look out for distractors. Now, distractors are shapes that have no particular link or have no business being in that set, but they're there to distract you and to waste your time. So just be aware that not every single shape in a set will have to do with the pattern. Sometimes a distractor will be put in just to basically be a bit rude, but if you see something and you just think it's completely random and completely out of place, then just be aware that it might just be. <laughs> right, to sort of conclude now, just remember that practice, repetition, and exposure are by far the most helpful things you can do to improve in this section. I remember when I was first starting revision for this section, hand on heart, I was scoring less than 500 and I absolutely hated it for that reason. But honestly, once I learned those rules and techniques and started to apply them to practice questions, my score just slowly started to shoot upwards. And luckily in the real exam, I scored 750. So just do what you gotta do, but just make sure you learn those rules. Also though, don't be too intimidated by a set that you've been staring at for ages and you just can't find anything. Because just remember that these questions are really difficult and they're designed to be complex and that's just the point of this section. So just don't let one set bring you down. Try not to give up and stay true to your systematic approach. And that finally brings me to the end of this video. I really hope you found it somewhat useful. If you did, please, please give it a thumbs up and make sure to subscribe for more content coming soon. Of course, I'll be making more videos on the rest of the UCAT section, so make sure that you look out for those. I'm also thinking of making a few videos where I'm going through actual questions and sort of talking through my live thinking process when I answer those. So let me know in the comment section below if that's something that you would find interesting and hopefully we can sort something out. Once again, best of luck if you're sitting in the UCAT this year. Remember to stay motivated, stay grinding, short-term pain, long-term gain, and I hope to see you soon. <laughs> Bye.